I'm Kim Rip Soon. My topic this afternoon is uh, reconciling peace with justice in Cambodia. Is there a dichotomy between peace and justice? Is it peace or justice? As reflected in the sentiments of those who say, let bygones be bygones, let's bury the past. Um, why pursue justice, e.g. prosecution, when it could create instability? Is that not breaking the existing peace? Or is it peace and justice, peace with justice? Within the next 15 minutes or so, I, um, we will glance briefly to our tragic past and hone in on the efforts that um, we are um, trying in, in, in our efforts to redress the past for our present and for our future in the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Um, and um, in so doing, I am arguing that justice is an intrinsic element of peace. There can be no genuine peace without justice. The dichotomy of peace or justice is a false one. I believe that peace with justice is a human value of universal yearning. So we live in a country, Cambodia, mired in disproportions, in contradictions, in uh, um, human rights abuses. When a boy steals a piece of bread, he is sent to jail. When a man kills two million of his countrymen, he is invited to Paris for a peace conference. We live in a country where to be an orphan is to be common, where post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, cripples our family, our friends, our neighbors, our countrymen, currently at 14 million. And so 35 years ago this past April, our country plunged into the abyss of human suffering, as you know, when the Khmer Rouge communists took over and within a matter of three and a half years took the lives of one third of almost two million um, people, including my parents, your parents, your grandparents, um, our aunts, our uncles, our neighbors. Um, so we Cambodians yearn for peace, but we want peace more than just the absence of war. We want peace with justice. We want peace that is more than just the absence of conflict, or in the words of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., the absence of tension. We want peace to subside the internal turmoil and to purge the demons from within. We want both negative peace, the absence of tension, and we want positive peace as well, the presence of justice. Some 30 years on, we have the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, or formerly what is known as the Extraordinary Chambers in the courts of Cambodia, to start us on this journey of peace with justice. So briefly, I'm gonna give you an outline, um, give you a contour of what, of what this Khmer Rouge Tribunal looks like. Um, so the, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal, first of all, um, result, is a result of 10 years of political compromise between the United States, uh, the United Nations, and the government of Cambodia. Basically, it's the result, um, it's a political product. It's the result, uh, um, it's the result of the lowest common, common denominator. This is already flawed from the very beginning because of that nature, and we have to be comfortable with that. It began, began operation in July of 2006. Um, it is a mixed or hybrid court of UN and Cambodian personnel. It's located um, in a military compound on the outskirts of Phnom Penh. And if we are to look on a spectrum of solely national court, solely international court, for example, the International Criminal Court in The Hague, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal is somewhere here. It's, it's closer to the national court system and it's fully financed by the international community. So the name is the Extraordinary Chambers in the Courts of Cambodia. It's not solely national, but it, it is closer in that regard. It has the jurisdiction or the legal authority to try crimes that were committed only between 1975 of April and January of 1979. Not mass crimes before, not mass crimes be um, after. And it has the subject matter jurisdiction of to try crimes of genocide, crimes against humanity, and um, the grave breaches of the uh, Geneva Convention, also murder as recognized by the Cambodian law in the Penal Code of 1956. 
the personal jurisdiction, the court can only try two groups of individuals, those most responsible and the senior Khmer Rouge leaders, and those are the, the words of, in the agreement. And as you know, we have four cases, two active and two dormant due to political interference. The first one is basically almost done, is on appeal, but is, is effectively done. That concerns Deutsch, the director of Dos Lang. And the second one, case 002, clumps the four senior Khmer Rouge leaders together and um, um, is expected to start sometime this year. This is the heart of the matter. The, and the other three, um, it's, um, it's most likely won't move forward. So the Khmer Rouge Tribunal is a court of law, and as a court of law, it offers legal justice. It offers legal accountability. It offers political justice, because like I said, it's the result of a political compromise. Um, it, it allows for political accountability or victor's justice in this regard. And again, we have to be comfortable with that. It, as a court of law, it offers symbolic, and it can only offer symbolic justice, because only five individuals right now are detained. So in the, with regards to symbolic justice, as you know, justice must be seen to be done, and a court of law provides the most symbolic, the most visible form of justice. Um, as, a, as a symbol, it allows us collectively to repudiate the mass crimes of the past um, in our attempt to restore moral, a moral order. And also in the process, we would like to expect that it is chipping away at impunity and it is preventing and, um, and, uh, um, and um, acting as a deterrence to put potential perpetrators on notice. Also, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal as a court of law uh, and provides and offers selective, and it can only provide selective, not comprehensive justice. Um, and it can only and does provide proximate, not perfect justice. Even though it will push to ask whether we um, expect perfect justice, we wouldn't say it, but many times we speak and we think as if a legal mechanism can offer perfect justice. And of course, it cannot. And of course, as a court of law, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal provides and offers vertical justice. The state is exacting justice on the individual in a linear vertical manner. And the other form of vertical justice, of course, is divine justice, but of course that doesn't um, um, involve us. So as a court of law, um, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal is limited. But any court of law is limited. Because think about it, even in the most developed countries like the United States or Norway, where I just came from, a court of law is based solely on evidence, on the availability of evidence, on the use of evidence. And related to that, it, it's constrained by fair trial rights, by evidentiary rules, by procedural rules, by um, courtroom decorum, by the very arcane, archaic legalese that is really understandable to maybe a handful of us. So generally, any court, not just in broken Cambodia, but in a developed country, is based, um, it's limited because of that. And of course, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal has its special unique limitations in addition to the general limitations. And um, as we know that justice too long delayed is just it's denied um, uh, as um, acknowledged by a Supreme, US Supreme Court justice. And evidence here is 30 years old. The two types of evidence, the documentary evidence is either non-existence it's um, lost or it's compromised. The human evidence, the witnesses, are either dead or they're fearful to come forward. So already we're very, very limited and very, um, very challenged in the, uh, in the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. And then there are charges of corruption, of political interference, of um, a lack of judicial independence on the Cambodian side of the courts. There are three official working languages in the courts and, and the associated problems with that. And of course, the magnitude of the crime. We are not talking about a simple murder. We're not talking about a crime scene that is, that is um, uh, localized to Tulslaing or to Chiang Ai. We're talking about the crime scene that is the whole of Cambodia, um, comprising of 200 detention centers, of, uh, um, of hundreds, if not thousands, of killing fields strewn across Cambodia. And we know that the defendants um, are ailing our age. They're in their late 70s, early 80s. Um, and the list goes on with regards to the specific challenges of this Khmer Rouge Tribunal. 
So the Khmer Rouge Tribunal is a code of law. As a code of law, it is necessary, but it is not sufficient. Moreover, it is deficient. However, why is it that I still believe and we still believe in this um, Khmer Rouge Tribunal? Because the Khmer Rouge Tribunal is both a court of law and a court of public opinion. And when we realize that it is also a court of public opinion, we can try to multiply and um, magnify the benefits in the court of public opinion. We can be creative, we can be intentional and strategic. Um, in, in, in trying to, in to um, create more um, uh, peace values and benefits in the court of public opinion. And what are those benefits that we're seeing and that we can multiply and produce some more now and in the future in, in, in our pursuit of, um, of a more positive legacy? Well, in the court of public opinion, where we, and we can pursue social justice. The court of law is limited to legal justice, it's limited to political justice. We can provide social justice. We can provide poetic justice. Facing genocide um, is, is an example of how I'm reacting and I'm getting my justice through film. Enemies of the people are all examples of um, forms of poetic justice. We, um, in the court of public opinion, we, can, we are seeing and we can build on in, in creating more benefits in, um, to, to build on the restorative justice. Restorative justice have more values than just punitive, um, penal, uh, legal, uh, and punishment, than just prosecution. Um, there's room for forgiveness, there's room for dialogue, there's room for interaction, and for the reconciliation that we've been talking and everyone is talking about. It also allows for transitional justice mechanisms that, again, is more than just prosecution. And um, as and the, and the court of law provides vertical justice of the court versus the perpetrator, in the court of public opinion, we can, we can um, build on the horizontal justice of individual versus individual, the victim and the perpetrator. And this is where there's room for forgiveness. An individual has no right to forgive and the legal process that is the vertical justice, but we can forgive horizontally. And of course, that, is, that has a different pace and its own journey and process. And we're seeing that the Khmer Rouge Tribunal is acting as a catalyst um, um, in the court of public opinion to break the silence of the last 30 years, to transition us out of a period of 30 years of communicative silence, uh, communicative silence to a culture of memory that we're trying to build. And now we're pushing for provincial learning centers in the 24 provinces, for memorials. Right now, we only have Do Slang and we only have Chiang Ai. Where and there is no effort in preservation in the other um, authentic sites um, and the, the killing fields, and we're, we're pushing for that, and we're using the process as um, of, of victims in, uh, as direct parties and other um, uh, means to to um, to lobby in the court of public opinion, and we can do this because we're not constrained by unfair trial rights and all the other um, uh, issues that I had raised earlier, and of course. The court itself is generating a lot of educational materials, and, and, and that has jumpstarted conversations and interviews and films um, in the court of public opinion. So both, in both spheres, the court of law and the court of public opinion, um, they are generating a lot of education materials. And now there are efforts to translate the piles and piles of legal documents into a more vernacular form, into a more usable form, into a virtual tribunal. And as you know, once we have a prototype, it's so inexpensive to multiply and to duplicate and to pass it on to the provincial learning centers. And in the provincial learning centers, we are demanding, we are putting a prior claim on the assets that is in the court of, um, uh, at the Khmer Rouge Tribunal right now that are in the millions. What happens when the court closes? Well, we want them to, and to furnish the in provincial learning centers. So what are some of the legacies that we're seeing? Well, I mentioned a lot. And you know, I've been focused, I've been emphasizing the benefits in the court of um, uh, the Khmer Rouge Tribunal um, as a court of public opinion, where we're seeing the benefits, um, where we're seeing the peace values, where we can expand and build on a more durable, substantive peace than just a fragile peace in the absence um, that is just the absence of tension. Um, and we know that there are times when creative tension is necessary to bring about positive change, to create this more durable, substantive peace. And we have it now, this creative tension in the form of the Khmer Rouge Tribunal. Um, 
and we are trying to reconcile our past um, for our present and our future, right? and we are using it to also reconcile and peace with justice, um, and of course, peace that is more than just the absence of tension, um, but a peace that is um, that is both um, with the, and has the presence of justice, all the different forms of justice, not just legal justice or political justice, which is very limited. And we know that just, um, and also we're trying to create and multiply and broaden the definition of justice in the court of public opinion um, to embrace more than um, just, again, legal justice, the, the legal accountability, but social poetic justice, horizontal vertical justice, and all the transitional justice mechanisms and values such as healing, reconciliation, forgiveness, and dialogues that we are seeing in the court of public opinion. So thus, we, I see hope in the challenges, and um, simply put, peace or justice is a false choice. It is peace with justice. And um, to um, conclude, I will end with the words of the uh, Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., who um, encouraged us in saying that the arc of the moral universe is long, but it bends toward justice. Thank you.